It's a great privilege uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Sarfraz, a uh, very flamboyant uh, laparoscopic surgeon from Eastern India. Uh, with his own style of uh, operating and talking, and uh, is so well known over the country. And uh, uh, my request was to was to him to uh, start from the basics and uh, you know demystify advanced laparoscopic surgery. And I hope that's what he'll do uh, in uh, days to come. Welcome, Sarfraz, and it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Dr. Patta. Uh, I think it's a great, a great honor to be on this platform. And as I was saying just some time back that uh, uh, these kind of online learning platforms are breaking all barriers. There seem to be no universities, no colleges, no states anymore. And learning has become one of the unifying factors uh, of our society. And uh, uh, do I have your permission, Dr. Patta, to start the presentation? Yes, sir. First, please start. Okay. So let me share the screen. And uh, yeah, so uh, I come from Calcutta and I run a digestive surgery clinic. Uh, this is the beautiful hospital that I go to every day in Kolkata. Hopefully the uh, pandemic is off soon and we could be enjoying more of the outward space, which is uh, very beautiful in this hospital. I have been asked to start with uh, taking lectures on laparoscopic surgery. And today it's going to be on minimal access surgery for uh, ventral hernia. What I have done is I have divided this into two classes, one which is going to happen today and the other one a fortnight later. Uh, with, these, uh, with this uh, talk today, I would like to cover the following. Uh, introduce you all to IEHS guidelines, uh, International Endo Hernia Society guidelines, which is very important to all of us. I also would like to begin with talking about advantages of minimal access surgery and the disadvantages of minimal access surgery over open surgery for hernia. Then I would like to talk about certain techniques, the commoner ones today, and the not so common ones in the next class. I would be taking an extensive uh, talk on IPOM, the intraperitoneal only mesh hernioplasty or the laparoscopic ventral hernia repair as it is called. I would touch on its principles, indications, procedure, complications. Uh, towards the end, I would touch on atypical sighted hernias where IPOMs have to be either modified or given up altogether in favor of other repairs which are extraperitoneal. And lastly, I will talk about the complications of these procedures. I do understand that many of the audience are postgraduate trainees and junior surgeons, and they probably would be using this lecture in their exam or for writing short notes or for answering vivas, and as all, uh, all, and also to upgrade their knowledge on ventral hernia surgery. So with those basic outline, let me begin the presentation. Now, International Endo Hernia Society, or IEHS, guidelines are important to hernia surgeons across the world. Now, there have been guidelines laid earlier, but this is the one which was updated in 2019 and published here. If you can get the entire manuscript, you would get the updated guidelines regarding hernia surgery. Today, I'll be talking only on the ventral hernia. Before I embark on the talk itself, I would like to draw the attention of especially the postgraduate trainees and junior surgeons that uh, the level of evidences are now graded as one, two, five. Level one is the highest level evidence and generally these are the meta-analysis of well-established randomized controlled trials. Level two is a little lower than that, three lower, four lower, five lower. I'm not going to the details, but just to give you an idea, level five is an expert opinion. There is no data coming forth, but an expert opinion. So there's the least evidence available. And level one is a very good level of evidence. So you would find on my slides, level one, two, three, four, five written, which is what IEHS has written. And, uh, uh, you the interpretation should be if it's level one it's very good quality evidence and if you can 
trust that statement and level five evidence is comes with a weak recommendation. Now, sometimes you would see uh, written not evidence, but recommendation. Now recommendation is when uh, surgeons see, the expert surgeons see the evidences and they grade it. If there's a very good quality evidence, it's grade A and grade B is the poor quality evidence based on which some statements are made, some recommendations are made. So these are two things that all uh, students of uh, surgical science should know. Why minimal access surgery for ventral hernia? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages of doing minimal access surgery compared to open surgery for ventral hernia? This could be a viva question. This could be a short note. This could be something which is required for understanding. Now, you would probably know that for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the, it is well established how laparoscopy scores over uh, uh, open surgery. But when it comes to uh, hernia, it is not as clear cut, but there are certain advantages. Now, if we were to do an umbilical hernia with open surgery, this is the kind of incision that you would see on the left side. And on the right side, those transfacial suture sites and three small holes would what one would expect a minimal access surgeon to use. Uh, the visual impression is important but because I would like to take this forward when I put in the next slide, and which is, if you look at the laparoscopic surgery, the holes are choker holes, and therefore the trauma is less, there is no cut incision, the surgical site infection is very low. If you were asked in the exam, what is the single most important advantage of minimal access surgery over open ventral hernia surgery? It is decreased surgical site infections. Infection rates are very, very low with minimal access surgery. Number two, in minimal access surgery, usually patients uh, go home much earlier than they do when they have an open surgery. Number three, their return to work is faster. Now, Remember, decrease surgical side infection, even if you forget everything else. What about the quality of life in the long term? Do patients with laparoscopic surgery uh, fare better? It seems so. When patients are asked questions months after their surgery, those who had laparoscopic surgery are more satisfied than the ones who had open surgery, probably reflecting the psyche of people towards open incisions and wounds and the uh, and the relatively increased incidence of infections and seromas. However, laparoscopic surgery has certain very important disadvantages. Now you can see it's written level 1A in the bottom, which means this is high quality evidence. What we know is laparoscopic surgery gives some advantages, but one of the major disadvantages with laparoscopic surgery is higher risk for bowel injury. So how does gut injury happen more frequently in a minimal access surgery? As the term implies minimal access, minimal trauma, we must understand that access is minimal trauma, but the surgery is not minimal trauma. If you look at the procedure itself, we have to go inside the abdomen, and then from inside the abdomen, we have to bring down the additions of the gut and the omentum from the sac. And since we have to do that, there is a possibility of having more bowel injuries. In an open surgery, when we go from anterior to posterior, skin, fat, sheath, and the sac, then we higher, there's a higher chance that we may be encountering the bowel less often. Two, we have the advantage of tactile feedback with the fingers, and that can probably minimize the bowel trauma. So major disadvantage of laparoscopic surgery is that there's a higher risk of bowel injury, one particular literature, which is quoted by most of us, places it at 4% injury rate, okay? Now, laparoscopic surgery means that we have to put in a mesh inside the abdomen close to the bowel. Therefore, it has to have a coating. And that mesh is called coated mesh or composite mesh. They are costly compared to the mesh used in open surgery. So open surgery mesh would be polypropylene mesh, may cost anywhere between, depending on the size, 2,000 to 15,000 rupees. Whereas a uh, coated mesh would cost anywhere between 20,000 to a lakh of rupees, depending on the size. So it's a very costly mesh. Plus a coated mesh needs to be fixed with tackers, which can cost you anything between 20,000 to 50,000 rupees. So those are the two major disadvantages. 
Now, this is a question which comes frequently in the MCQ I've seen that open surgery versus laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery has the following advantage, A, B, C, uh, except A, B, C, D. And uh, one of the choices are, uh, is pain. So remember that pain in open surgery and laparoscopic surgery is same, is similar eh, according to literature. And that is probably because although the trauma access trauma is less in laparoscopic surgery, the uh, mesh fixation because of the sutures and tackers in the peritoneal side leads to pain enough uh, to make sure that both open and laparoscopic surgery arms uh, patients have equal equivalent pain scores. So remember, pain scores are equivalent both in open ventral hernia surgery as well as laparoscopic ventral hernia surgery. Uh, and when we say laparoscopic ventral hernia surgery, we mean IPOM. Uh, there is another advantage of laparoscopic surgery over open surgery. And I would want you to hear this carefully. In patients with BMI of more than 30, which is obesity, cut off for obesity, these patients generally have a larger defect and they have higher recurrence rate. So when you operate, when we operate on them, they would have a higher recurrence rate. And these defects are usually larger, probably because larger the abdomen, larger, uh, higher the intra-abdominal pressure, and possibly the defect size also increases. And this may be the reason why they have higher recurrence rates. So hear me again carefully, if the BMI were to be different like 25 and 35 and hernia defect is only three centimeters in both arms would the recurrence be higher in a bmi 35 we do not have the answer what we know is if there's somebody's bmi 25 and bmi 35 and if they're uh, compared the recurrence is higher in patients with bmi 35 but what we don't know is are those hernia defects larger in size and that is why the recurrence is higher so we do not know that but importantly, what I wanted to, uh, why I put this slide here is because the advantage of laparoscopic surgery over open surgery in this case. What is the advantage? Laparoscopic surgery has decreased surgical site infection and therefore it is recommended for obese people. Imagine operating on an obese people with open surgery, an open incision with a huge subcutaneous fat, patient who's got a comorbidity, obesity associated comorbidity like diabetes. It is going to incur higher uh, seroma rates and infection rates. So in obese people, which is better, laparoscopic or open? If laparoscopy is feasible, laparoscopy is better. Now let's look at the techniques available for ventral hernia. Let's put them simply. This is the first slide and I have another slide. Those are uncommon surgeries. These are the common surgeries. Let's talk about them. IPOM, intraperitoneal onale mesh Hernioplasty or meshplasty. So when you when we say intraperitoneal only meshplasty, remember you may argue only means putting it subcutaneous. True, this may be a misnomer, but it is conventionally called intraperitoneal only meshplasty because from inside this is like an only. Okay. So uh, very soon this term may be changed into underlay which is the correct term, intraperitoneal underlay mesh plasty. But for the time being, everybody calls it intraperitoneal onlay mesh plasty, whereby we put in the mesh from inside the peritoneal cavity. When we do IPOM, along with the closure of the hernia defect, then it is called IPOM plus. We will see the advantage of IPOM plus. Then we have tape. In certain situations, like atypically sighted hernias, which are suprapubic hernia, subzephoid hernia, lumbar hernia, right iliac fossa hernia, which are very close to bones, ribs, diaphragm, heart, iliac vessels, nerves. In these cases, we can't apply the mesh and tackle it blindly. We have to uh, peel it off, and this is called the, the this surgery is called transabdominal, partly extraperitoneal. If the mesh is partly extraperitoneal, partly intraperitoneal, it's called tape transabdominal, partially extraperitoneal. I'll show you a picture later on, so don't fret on it. You will see it. Then there's a surgery called transabdominal preperitoneal, where we have gone in abdominally, but we peel off the peritoneum, see the structures, put in the mesh, and don't 
uh, we don't uh, fix the mesh in the places where there are vital structure. That is TAPP approach of ventral hernia. Or we could go transabdominal and then go behind the muscle, not preperitoneal, but go uh, cut off the posterior rectus sheath. If we do cut the posterior rectus sheath and go into that plane, we will get into the retromuscular plane. That is called transabdominal retromuscular technique. But for us, most of us, IPOM and IPOM Plus is the minimum to know. The other three also are uh, worth knowing, uh, especially if you are a, a younger surgeon. Now, there are more terms which I will explain in the next class. Today, I just wish to get you acquainted with these terms. Endoscopic reef stopper, reef stopper repair, as you know is the repair which is retromuscular, popularized in 1970s, is making a comeback. This can be done endoscopically, and how it is done, we'll take it in the next class. Component separation techniques are both anterior and posterior. Posterior component separation technique is called TAR, transverse abdominal release. And when this is done endoscopically, it is called endoscopic TAR or ETAR. Again, we will not go beyond this today. We'll take it in the next class. And similarly, endoscopic anterior component separation is called an EACS. But today, let's look at IPOM. Where is IPOM done? What are the indications? The indications of IPOM. And before I begin, what is IPOM? The principle is, let's go into the peritoneal cavity, uh, inflate it with the carbon dioxide, see from inside the defect and the adhesions, bring down the adhesions, Close the defect in an IPOM plus or don't close the defect if you're doing a pure IPOM. Take a composite or a coated mesh, put it in such a way that the center of the mesh is, is equal to the center of the defect. And then we fix the mesh uh, in the periphery in two circular ring. Now, this is possible for small to medium sized defects. Common sense says that if the defect is like 15 centimeters. Then how would you handle or how would we handle a huge mesh which has which has to be like a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter mesh within the abdominal cavity? So we can't. It's difficult. So small to medium size defects can be handled, and that is with IPOM. And number two, we have to remember only those hernias can be handled where we get at least a five centimeter margin of the mesh from the defect. Now, this is something which is basic minimum to remember. This, these statements may get modified, but for all, most of us, this is uh, good enough to say in the exam. If you look at the IEHS guidelines, they have said laparoscopic repair can be done for ventral hernias for defect size up to 10 centimeters. I would say that is mostly not done. Most people stay at about five centimeters. And beyond, beyond that, you will see that there are surgeons who have opting for different kinds of surgery, which, but we'll take it in the next class. But from the IEHS point of view, 10, still 10 centimeter, we can still do laparoscopic repair. What are the contraindications of doing an IPOM? Remember the principle is that we have to go inside the abdomen first, inflate it with carbon dioxide and visualize the addition and the uh, hernia defect. If the patient comes in obstruction and the small bowel are dilated, then one cannot see, one cannot go inside the abdomen safely with a very needle. One cannot inflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide. One cannot visualize the hernia. So obstruction is a contraindication. Of course, if it is a subacute obstruction, it may be a relative contraindication. But with hugely distended bowels, it's an absolute contraindication. As I have mentioned earlier, small to medium sized defects are okay, but large defects are not amenable to laparoscopic repair or IPOM. A, the recurrence is very high. Two, uh, the functionality is not restored. And three, technically it will be too difficult to handle a big mesh, right? Third, if the hernia defect is close to bones and vital structures, like in a suprapubic hernia is too close to the pubic bone and urinary bladder. In a subzephoid is close to the diaphragm, heart, ribs. In a right iliac fossa post appendicectomy hernia, for example, uh, the iliac vessels and the nerves femoral nerve, bilateral femoral cutaneous nerve are all there. So we cannot tack it or fix the mesh there blindly. We may injure these structures. So this is a typical example where we can use an IPOM, a paraumbilical hernia. This is a primary hernia. 
and then there's something called incision hernia where there's a previous repair and uh, previous incision which has failed and uh, led to a hernia so those are incision hernia so in the hernias which are in and around the navel in the midline uh, at the navel or just above or just below these are great for ipom let's look at the 10 steps of ipom i've said that before i'll say it again because it's so important to remember a at the palmer's point what is the palmer's point the palmer's point is the safest entry route into the abdomen for laparoscopic surgery it is at the junction of mid clavicular line and the right costal margin so just below that just below the right costal margin and the mid clavicular line intersection that is our palmer's point and if we go through a, with a very needle uh, which is a blind technique uh, then we need to choose the safest spot in the abdomen this is the safest spot a hardly any surgery is done on that side except for some pancreatic surgeries and splenic surgery which are uncommon and two uh, at that area, if the anesthetist has deflated the stomach, there is hardly any structure one can injure, right? So, pneumoperitoneum through palmar's point, then the camera is put, a five millimeter camera is put through that point, and one visualizes the ab abdomen and puts in two more ports, one at the epigastrium, one at the flank. Some people do three flank technique. We do two flank and one epigastric uh, port technique. I'll show you the port positions. Then we do a diagnostic laparoscopy to be sure that we have not missed something else. For example, if there's a number like a hernia, it could be representative of a cirrhotic patient, right? There could be ascites, in which case we may like to withdraw our surgery. There could be incidental tuberculosis and ascites. We may like to withdraw the surgery. Then we do adhesiolysis. We bring down the omental adhesion with an energy source and bowels with sharp instruments like a scissor. Defect closure is afterwards done as an IPOM plus, and I'll show you in a video. Then we apply a coated mesh, which is also called a composite mesh. And we will talk about what it means. And I've written appropriate size, and I will talk about it again in some time. Then we will centralize the mesh, put it in the center. The center of the defect should be the center of the mesh. And then we fix the mesh with sutures and instruments called tackers. And then we put the momentum in the bottom so that if this coated mesh do invite additions these additions will be not to the bowel but to the momentum and lastly the 10 millimeter port through which the mesh has gone that port is closed with delayed absorbal sutures and skin stitches are given now this is the port position of a typical ipom c is for the camera this is the farmer's point through which we entered and they put in the camera visualize and with the c in place as the first port we put in B, D, and A. In this patient, A is shown very high up. A can be lower down also. Uh, a is the port A is done to apply tacker on the left side. And with D, we apply tacker on the right side of the mesh. I'll show you in the video. You can see that the surgeon and the camera person is are standing on the left side, and the monitor is on the right side at the hip level, giving us triangulation especially if you're working from b and d sometimes we keep the camera at b and we work with c and d that is also possible let's look at a video to have a visual impression of how ipom looks like this is an incision hernia that is why so much of additions are present that is a ultrasonic shear with which we are bringing down the momentum now remember uh, we would use scissors wherever we encounter or suspect that there could be bowel. Now, I have purposely chosen a more difficult case to show for IPOM. A primary ventral hernia would not have any additions, but I wanted to show you a video where there are additions and to stress why we have a 4% incidence of bowel injury in a laparoscopic surgery. Now, see here, there are three defects. These are called Swiss cheese. If you've seen cheese, and uh, those the cheese with their multiple holes that's the swiss cheese so it looks like a swiss cheese here right and now we're closing the defect and because we're closing the defect this is called a ipom plus which suture is being used a non-absorbable suture which one polypropylene now this is a taper cut needle and in since there are uh, two hernia defects the one hernia defect i showed you 
uh, where we close with intracorporeal suturing. The other hernia defect we are closing by transfacial suture. So we are putting in uh, this needle and we are pulling out these sutures externally through the same skin incision outside and placing the not subcutaneous skin. Now here's the composite mesh. And you can see there are four corners, uh, uh, not in the corners, in the midline and uh, on the transverse axis, we have got four sutures. And we have marked the abdomen outside from where we will take this uh, transfacial suture. It's a single stab incision. And once it is pulled up, it becomes taut. And we keep the pressure at six millimeters. And once it is taut, we apply tackers. Now, what you are seeing here is a tacker. It is an instrument which has about three to four millimeter penetration. And it holds the mesh in its place. Now, we are putting some extra transfacial sutures. This will be subcutaneous knots. So there are plenty of things I showed you in this very rapid video, but this would pave the way for what comes next. A, so this is a coated mesh. Many of us would like to know what is a coated mesh? What is it coated with? And how is it different from a polypropylene or a polyester mesh? What does the IEHS guideline say for ventral hernia? It says that we cannot use unprotected polypropylene, unprotected porous polypropylene polyester mesh cannot be given to direct contact with the bowel because there's a higher risk of bowel erosion that may lead to bowel resection in subsequent surgery. That's number one. So these polypropylene and polyesters can be coated on one side with an absorbable biologic material, which is biologically compatible. And that can be used within the human body in contact with the gut and the chances of adhesions uh, erosions will be lower is the argument. So a coated mesh has two surfaces. One is a parietal surface, which is going to be stuck to the anterior abdominal wall, the peritoneum of the anterior abdominal wall. And the other surface is the visceral surface, which has got the anti-adhesion barrier. Now, uh, what is the role of the uh, parietal surface? That is naked polypropylene or polyester. That's the commonest. PTFE is more or less not used in most places in the world. So polypropylene polyester will get incorporated with fibroblastic reaction with the peritoneum, right? And the opposite side has a polypropylene coated with another uh, material, which is going to get absorbed over time, over weeks. And that is going to um, um, prevent bowels from getting adherent to the mesh. Now, what are these coatings? As I said, these are absorbable. They're not going to be permanent. They're going to get absorbed. So after a few weeks, it can be only naked polypropylene. But what happens is during this time, before the naked polypropylene, the polyester appears, there'll be re-epithelization of that side. The mesothelium will come in and that will become the anti-adhesive barrier. Now, what are these coatings that we use? Hyaluronic acid, cellulose, polyethylene glycol, polyglycaprone, again, uh, oxidized regenerated cellulose, collagen, omega-3 fatty acids. So these are some names that are there. You could, these are something that we, you, we put it to memory. Uh, the important thing to remember is the concept that all of these are carbohydrate antigens, and we are using these as an absorbable coating for these meshes. And this is what makes them expensive. Uh, the, on the other side are the brand names uh, of the meshes, which you do not need to know as far as your examination is concerned. So as I said, uh, these absorbable uh, coatings are going to get absorbed in the body and will be replaced by mesothelium. And that is how it works. If the question is to a good student, are all these coatings absorbable? The answer is no. Some meshes like PTFE meshes uh, in the past, Composix mesh was a mesh being used frequently. Now it's not that commonly used. Uh, the PTFE mesh has a non-absorbable coating. PTFE by itself is used by vascular surgeons. It's, an, it's a non-absorbable layer. It's a non-absorbable material. And uh, that is not frequently used. Titanium is something which is being used uh, in the recent times. But again, very few surgeons use titanium coated mesh, but there are non-absorbable coatings which are inert and may prevent adhesions and erosions with the bowel and they are also used. Now, very important question. 
how do you decide what size of the mesh to use? A hernia defect could be one centimeter, two centimeters, four, 10 centimeters wide defect, 20 centimeters wide defect. So how do we decide about the mesh size when we're doing an IPOM? And how do we fix them? So I'm going to code the IEHS guidelines for this. A, we must do the adhesive lysis at whatever intra-abdominal pressure we want to do, which is 12 to 14 standard. But once you have done that, and we want to close the defect or we want to measure the defect, we must do it at a pressure of six millimeters of mercury. So we drop the intra-abdominal pressure and then when the pressure drops, the margins come closer. So it stands to common sense that if we were to inflate it, all defects would look, would look very large. If you bring it down to six millimeters of mercury, a lot of uh, the accurate size of the defect would be measured. So let's say it is a four centimeter defect, okay? A four centimeter wide defect. And the recommendation that comes next is there's a five centimeters minimum overlap required of the mesh on each side from the defect margin. So four plus five on one side, five on another side is five plus five plus four is 14 centimeters. The width of the mesh is mandatory. Now meshes come at 15 by 15 size or 15 by 20. And if you take a bigger mesh, 25 by 20, you can handle it, but it becomes increasingly difficult. So for a five centimeter defect, we can use a 15 centimeter wide mesh and get away. But if you have a seven centimeters mesh uh, wide defect, then you need seven plus five plus five, a minimum that's 17 centimeters. That's, so that would be a minimum of 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters or 20 by 25 centimeters mesh, which is difficult to handle. So that is why many surgeons wouldn't like to do an eye pump for defect size beyond five centimeters. Okay, so that's one concept I wanted to put in. It's a little uh, mathematical thing, but if you imagine, if you understand this, you rationalize this, you don't have to remember it to commit to memory, it will come to you automatically. Now, if the defect size is larger, then this five centimeter minimum overlap does not hold good. In fact, at that time, uh, uh, there is a lot of debate and controversy about overlaps and uh, there's a concept of knowing about defect area and then having the mesh area at least 13 times more of the defect area. But I will not go into the details of that. That is another level of understanding of part and parcel of research. As far as we are concerned today, we need to realize that higher defects, this five centimeter minimum, minimum overlap will not hold good. The overlap may need to be much higher, fixation needs to be much higher. And this statement, holds also true for obesity. So in obese people, the same five centimeter defect may warrant a 20 centimeter mesh instead of the usual 15 centimeter mesh. Now, when we talk about tackers, and I have mentioned the IHS guidelines say that it is better not to use only sutures because sutures can lead to pain. The transfacial sutures that we apply, and that can lead to pain. And on the other hand, the tackers alone have the tendency to fall off. And therefore, it is advisable to use a combination of sutures and tackers, as we shown in the video. I'll show you one more video to drive this message home. But the tacker should be used as a double crowning method. If you see in this picture carefully, you would notice that there is an outer crown of white uh, circular things. And then there's an inner circle that represents a double crown okay so outer circle of tackers inner circle of tackers and that is what is going to hold this mesh firmly towards the peritoneal side and in and the incorporation of the mesh with the peritoneum will be better now to i wanted to uh, explain how we put in the markings or how we mark the abdomen from outside when we are putting in the transfacial sutures. So remember in the video we showed that we are putting the 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter mesh, but if we were to uh, mark the uh, suture passer from where we are going to pass this uh, suture and hold the mesh, this will not be at 15 centimeters. Imagine, imagine the abdomen getting inflated and the peritoneal surface, and then you have the uh, muscles and then the fat and then the skin. So if you can imagine this way, uh, anything which is uh, going to be put at 15 centimeter from inside, one would have to go beyond that to get 
to the 15 centimeters, which means if the mesh here were to, we were to apply at 15 centimeters square mesh, we will have to make a, rectangle, a square of 18 centimeters or 20 centimeters. And those X's are the points where we will make an external skin incision and we will put in the uh, needle that you saw in the video and uh, take the uh, mesh out from those points because then this is going to be uh, translating into a 15 centimeter mesh from inside. So it does require some imagination. It does require some appreciation of how the abdomen will inflate and how these two points are going to be different. But I hope all of us can imagine that much and understand that the external markings for applying the transfacial sutures are different from uh, the mesh size. So if it's a 15 centimeter mesh, we'll make a diagram like this, like an 18 centimeter and put in the switches from those positions. It's the same thing being explained here. I am going to play this video once more, another video. This is a uh, mesh, which is 15 centimeters. And we are putting only two sutures. There's a uh, hernia at the midline of the navel. And these are midline, Suture. So this is now 18 centimeters apart. Uh, we have put in the sutures at the midline, which centers it. And then we are tacking it on the right side. That is the right side. You're looking at the bottom of the 35. And now that the tacker is coming from the opposite side, see? So I told you there were, there were four uh, uh, you know, ports. The opposite port is now tacking it. These are absorbable sutures. This is not non-absorbable tackers. Sorry, these are absorbable tackers, not non-absorbable tackers. And now we are putting in these transpatial sutures. So where is the transpatial sutures coming from? 18 centimeters or 20 centimeters, not at 15 centimeters because the, ex the skin side is going to be different. And because we have, uh, we know the tackers are expensive to reduce the cost, we can also suture the mesh with the peritoneum like this so that our cost of tacker is minimized. Remember, if you're going to put in double crowning of uh, these tackers, they are going to uh, become more and more costly. So here we are, we are showing you various fixation methods, transfacial sutures, intracorporeal suturing, tackers. Before I proceed, leave this slide, between the absorbable tackers and non-absorbable tackers, absorbable tackers have a better quality of life. It is mentioned in the guidelines. However, many surgeons do use non-absorbable, some use absorbable. Lastly, there are some tackers which are having a absorbable head, but the shaft or the body of the instrument is a stainless steel. So it's a non-absorbable tack with a absorbable coating. Uh, so the coating at the head prevents adhesions, whereas the, uh, the shaft gives better, better penetration. So there can be a tacker could be absorbable, non-absorbable, or a combination of absorbable and non-absorbable. Now, coming to IPOM Plus. You may have seen in the video that we had, we were closing the defect, right? I showed you in the first video that we were closing the defect. If you don't close the defect, if you don't close the defect, we call it IPOM. But if we close the defect, we call it IPOM Plus. So we have closed the defect. Uh, and uh, what is the advantage of IPOM Plus over IPOM? So this is the literature that most of us quote, where they looked at a few hundreds of patients, uh, those who had IPOM versus IPOM Plus, and they found where the defect closure was done, the rates of seroma, and I'll explain what is a seroma in the subsequent slide for the time being, assume it is a collection of fluid near a hernia site. This will be lower when we do defect closure, okay? So in an IPOM, since the sac is intact, it is, uh, it is not getting opposed to the mesh. Uh, the mesh is uh, getting um, opposed to a thin, flimsy, hernia sac instead of the sheath, there is a higher chances of seroma with an IPOM compared to an IPOM plus. And there's a decreased hospital stay. There are some literature pouring in showing that the recurrence rate may be lower, but it's too early to say that on a academic platform. Let's now go to atypical sighted hernias. What I showed you is a good operation, an IPOM plus or an IPOM is a good operation for hernias at the navel or below the navel or above the navel. But as soon as you go closer, or we go closer to the pubic bone or at the top towards the xephoid, we understand that we cannot tack this mesh or fix this mesh 
inferiorly in case of suprapubic hernia or superiorly in case of subzipoid or epigastric hernia because inferiorly there is a urinary bladder superiorly there is a rib cage there is a heart there is a lung so how do we fix that then if you imagine a lumbar hernia also in the lumbar hernia and a flank hernia how are we going to fix there is a colon there and in a right iliac fossa hernia like a post appendectomy hernia how are we going to fix the mesh there there is a iliac vessel femoral nerve the iliac bone itself so in these cases i pom is not feasible what procedures can we do here so the problem now is uh, to give you a visual example on the left side you can see a suprapubic hernia and do you see that if we dissect that area then you can see that the pubic bone uh, is there in the epigastric vessel at the top there are iliac vessels at the bottom where i have written suprapubic hernia the blue line is is the iliac vessels and uh, there are nerves uh, femoral nerves uh, nerves that we cannot injure at all at uh, any cost so these structures preclude prevent any uh, application of tacker or suture in this area similarly if you look at the subzipoid hernia Uh, below is the liver, and if you try to fix this tacker on the superior aspect, it may go into the heart, it may go into the lung or pleura and damage. There's a catastrophe waiting to happen. So, how do we uh, deal with these hernias? So, the solutions are: we dissect the peritoneum, we expose the important structures under, we keep them under vision. if we have to if there is enough space to put the entire uh, mesh uh, extra uh, peritoneally and we can cover it we can use a non coated mesh like polypropylene or polyester and fix it in few points and then cover the peritoneum back if we cannot do that and part of the mesh is going to remain extra peritoneal and part intra peritoneal then we have to use a coated mesh because the in the component which is intra peritoneal cannot be a naked polypropylene or polyester and that was called tape and as i have mentioned earlier this is the utility where it comes so the first um, uh, if it can be done entirely extra peritoneally it can be done in a pre peritoneal locations called tapp trans abdominal pre peritoneal if the mesh is applied in a retro muscular plane it's called trans abdominal retro muscular we have to go behind the posterior rectus sheath and then there is where you have to have uh, we all, we all we need to keep the mesh partly extra peritoneal partly intra peritoneal is called trans abdominal partly extra peritoneal that's tape in any event the principle is that we do not fix the mesh on to these vital structures we have dissected the space primarily for the reason of saving these structures so the ihs guideline for suprapubic hernia is we dissect the retropubic space expose the cooper ligament and fix the mesh with one the areas like pubic bone and cooper's ligament are safe but not in other areas or we can do it above the iliopubic tract in a subzipoid hernia we can bring the falciform ligament down go at least 5 cm above the defect margin and no tacking there we can apply sutures superficially and cautiously but we can put in tackers and sutures below the defect margin so let's look at a video of a subzipoid hernia so that we get an idea now subzipoid hernia is special because even if we reflect the falciform ligament we are still intra peritoneal and there is no way uh, that we can uh, uh, go into the layer where we can hide the mesh now see here is the hernia and we we are going to see that now yes and what we are trying to do we are trying to keep ourselves at a plane between the linea alba and the uh, the fat that is there the falciform that is there uh, including the hernial content that went in which was brought down and we are going till the top till we have at least 5 cm margin as usual we are going to close these defects since we have already seen that i am not going to show that aspect i am going to show you the mesh application so we put in this mesh which is a coated mesh and we have now understand what a coated mesh is we are applying tacker inferiorly okay in the anterior abdominal wall and we will not apply any tacker superiorly there is a heart a beating heart out there the lung and pleura you can see that the gall bladder and the liver is there what are we doing here we are putting in sutures and we are taking bites on the peritoneum superficially not going deep 
so that we do not injure the uh, uh, pleura, the lung and the heart. So these interrupted sutures which are being given here, they will hold the mesh in its position, right? So this is what uh, we do with a subzifoid hernia. Now this is again an eye palm. This is not a tape. This is not a term. This is not a TAPP approach. It's still an eye palm plus. But here the difference is that in the top, we are using sutures cautiously instead of tackers. So that finishes the subzifoid hernia. Now there are other ways of doing this surgery, but we will not keep it for this class. Now let's see another surgery where we will understand the term. So this is a right iliac fossa hernia after an appendicectomy scar, and we are going in the uh, cutting the posterior rectus sheath, and that's the rectus muscle, right? We can all identify the rectus muscle. We could have gone pre-peritoneal, but it was not possible in this patient. The peritoneum was too flimsy, so we are going retromuscular. So this is a term being shown. And you know that the rectus sheath gets adherent to the linear seminalis, and you cannot go there. So there's a technique called TAR, uh, which, we, which if you employ, then we can get into that space. That will come in the next class. So don't worry about if you don't understand what we are doing here. Try to understand that we are reflecting the flap from the midline, going up to the right leg fossa, keeping ourselves in the retromuscular plane initially, then going into the preperitoneal plane laterally. This is the adhesion which was there with the sac. And now what we are doing is we are cutting, we are raising the inferior flap. So we are cutting the the peritoneum from the inferior defect margin. And this will be will continue till we have exposed the iliac vessel, the femoral nerve. We have good amount of overlap, like 10 centimeters all around from the defect margin. And once that is so, we will close the defect, like we have been saying throughout this uh, lecture, that we believe in closing of these defects. So we are closing this defect with intracorporeal suturing. We can uh, do it uh, transfacially also but uh, this is what it is. So we are closing this with intercorporeal suturing. What, what uh, is being used? Uh, polypropylene. It's a non-absorbable suture, right? And now we are closing the bottom. Remember that there was a hole at the bottom of the posterior rectus sheet because we cut the hernia sac at the margin of the defect. So that defect is being closed. Now this is closed. And now we can apply the mesh starting from the midline and uh, pushing the mesh, the inferior mar margin up till the axillary line right into the posterior aspect okay so now that is being done and then we fix the mesh at two points remember the extra peritoneal mesh doesn't need to be fixed uh, doesn't need to be fixed in all cases but one may do so at one or two points unlike the eye palm mesh which has to be fixed at one centimeter interval at the periphery and double crowning needs to be done an extra peritoneal mesh has the advantage that we do not have to fix it uh, as assiduously that we have to do a, a mesh which is intraperitoneal because that can migrate anywhere. But here, it cannot migrate anywhere. It is in between the two layers of the abdominal wall. Right? So that is a, a huge advantage. So this was a term. If we were doing a TAPP, same thing. We would do the same thing except that we will not get into the posterior rectus sheath. We would be in the preperitoneal plane. We'll have to peel off the peritoneum. And that is possible in suprapubic hernias because here the peritoneum is uh, very flaccid and uh, can be easily peeled off from the uh, uh, muscles. Now, before I leave you, there are certain areas uh, uh, in a typical site that we need to understand are more complex, like a parastomal hernia. It could be a short note, it could be a viva question. And therefore, I think it's important to just spend a couple of minutes on parastomal hernias. A, a parastomal hernia is a hernia which is after a stoma has been made, an ileostoma or a colostomy, either after a cancer surgery or after an ab abdominal uh, gut resections where we do not want to join the, we, uh, we do not want to do any anastomosis because of the, uh, uh, the sepsis which is present in the abdomen and therefore a stoma has been done. Now this could be a temporary stoma, it could be a permanent stoma. If it is a temporary stoma and a hernia happens as a parastomal hernia, then we do not need to uh, address it till we go back in again and 
do the anastomosis, reverse the stoma, and at the same time, we can take care of the hernia. However, if it's a permanent stoma, then we may need to address it. And I will talk about the indication. It's not that the presence of parastomal hernia means that we have to operate on it. There are indications for it. We'll come to it. But I want all of us to appreciate it's a complex issue. There may be a background of cancer. It may be a permanent stoma. It may be a temporary stoma. Because the surgery may have happened as an open surgery and there may be a midline laparotomy, it may be associated with a concomitant midline hernia, right? So there may be a parastomal hernia and you look carefully, there's, we may find that there's another hernia in the midline at the laparotomy site. And since there's a background of cancer, some patients will have a parastomal hernia as a reflection of a cancer recurrence. Ascites has happened or they're met and that has forced the parastomal hernia. So we need to remember it's a complex issue. And because it's a complex issue, it has got high recurrence. What are the indications of the surgery? A, if there is a pain, then we have to operate. If there's obstruction of the parastomal hernia, then we need to obstruct, uh, operate. But most common indication for doing a parastomal hernia repair electively is when the stoma nurse says that is, there is difficulty in applying a stoma bag over the over the stoma. And at that time, we have to take a call whether we need to do surgery or not. So just the presence of parastomal hernia is not an indication of surgery. It's a very important line that all of us must remember. Now, if we compare the open surgery with laparoscopic repair, classical laparoscopic repair is the sugar baker repair. And although there are so many repairs which have come in recent times, I would want everyone to be conversant with what we mean by a sugar baker repair. Uh, versus a keyhole repair. And uh, between what happens between laparoscopic repair and open repair? A laparoscopic repair gives a lesser recurrence than open repair uh, in the standard uh, sugar baker technique. Number two, a sugar baker technique means that we are applying, we are going inside the abdomen, just like an eye pump, and we bring down the uh, uh, bowel from the parastomal hernia. The defect is closed. The, the stoma loop is lateralized to the abdominal wall and a mesh is placed on two sides so that it holds it to the lateral wall, but loosely so that it does not uh, uh, cause obstruction of the stoma itself. So that is sugar bacon. And if we make a hole to uh, go around the, um, uh, around the uh, loop, that's called a keyhole technique, that has a higher recurrence rate. So keyhole technique has been abandoned most by most surgeons and sugar baker is the is what is done but remember we have to remember that a high percentage of parastomal hernias also as i mentioned will have an associated midline mental hernia and that may also be addressed at the same time there's a very old video and as i said this is not the kind of surgery that uh, we do we have modified the surgery but look at the amount of adhesions that parastomal hernias will have this is after an apr for CA rectum and this patient had a obstruction uh, which we managed with conservative manage, uh, measures. And then we went for an elective surgery, plenty of adhesions. I'll take it a little forward till we reach the defect site. Now, I know it's, it's not a great and a pretty site because this is how they are. Uh, let's see, this is the defect now. And this is the loop. Now, how did we know which one to bring down? Because we have put in a Foley's catheter. This is the Viva question. We have put in a Foley's catheter in this sigmoid colon to identify that this is the stoma. This is one which is going out as a stoma. And the other bubbles were brought down because they did not contain the Foley's balloon. So that is how we safeguard the stoma. And that is how we bring this back. And now what we are doing, we are lateralizing this sigmoid uh, onto the lateral abdominal wall. And then we can apply a mesh on two sides loosely and that will be the sugar baker technique. The sugar baker technique does not allow one, uh, us to split the mesh to accommodate this, uh, uh, this stoma. Rather, it, it, uh, it tells us to uh, use the bowel itself as part of the anterior abdominal wall, but loosely, the wrap has to be loosely. So let me take a little forward to just give an idea. We did close the defect again, and this is how, how the mesh is put. I'll just show you the final picture that is how it looks okay i know it's again a, not a very uh, not a pretty picture but it's a very old video i dug it out 
and these are the transmissions which is being here. But it, see how loosely that bowel is there and uh, going in and the mesh, the composite mesh is uh, applied all over. Uh, so that is how a sugar baker, laparoscopic sugar baker technique is done. And now the last part and the last segment and the most important segment of my talk, complications of the procedures that I've talked about. I remember in my exam days in, the, uh, in MBBS and MS, we had been told that if anybody asks you complications, say intraoperative complications, early complications and delayed complications. I hope that has not changed so far in the schools because such an easy way to remember. And early complications could also be general complications and specific complications that's procedure specific. I have not put in any general complications here which are cardiac, pulmonary, renal, hepatic. But as, an, as a student, we must learn to say this in one flow so that it is, uh, is impressive to the examiner. Uh, what are the intraoperative complications of the procedures that I've shown? A, the injuries. We can have injuries to the vessels, gut, and solid organs, right? And I've told you that the gut injury is, a, is an important side effect of an IPOM. Up to 4% of bowel injury have been reported in one literature. Early complications can be seroma, hematoma, and infections. And they're called surgical site occurrences and surgical site infections in scientific jargon. I would explain them and I would want everyone to remember these terminologies uh, rather than only seroma, hematoma, and infection. And a delayed complication would obviously, the most important would be a recurrence. However, uh, a delayed SSO like a seroma or a delayed infection like a mesh sepsis and sinus tracts are not uncommon. Inclu and, and additions are something also that I will touch upon. So this is in one slide, all the complications that we need to know. What are the intraoperative complications? Let's say we were doing an IPOM, and it's a very common question in an exam. And while we're doing isolysis, we have a small gut injury. What are we going to do? The examiner asks us. So the answer is, what is the extent of injury? Has there been a spillage? What is the gut which has been injured? So if it's a small bowel injury, small hole, no spillage, I will suture it and complete the procedure and apply the mesh. If it is a colonic injury, I will abandon the procedure, repair it, abandon the procedure and go back in again for doing a repair later on. If it is a small bowel injury and it has, uh, uh, the spillage has been significant uh, or the trauma is large, then again, I will retreat. I'll do repair and I'll retreat. Uh, if I am not comfortable to do laparoscopic suturing, I would do an open conversion, lapro formal laparotomy and deal with the injury. Finally, uh, if we were to do this, delayed repair, could be a laparoscopic repair. It could also be an open surgery in case we don't want to go back in again to a violated abdomen. So this is the answer to the question that is commonly asked in the exam or comes in the short note. What are the early complications? Now the early complications I mentioned, surgical side infection, let's take that first. The risk factors for infections as laid down by IEHS guidelines is that if we see a patient, we will have to tell the patient, the chance of your having an infection is 2%, 10%, or 20%. Now, how do we say that? So there's something called a ventral hernia working group grading system, grade one, two, three, four. Recently, three and four have been combined as one. That's the modified grading system. What it means is low, a grade one risk is when there is no comorbidity and there is no wound contamination. Okay, simple. Grade two, when there's a comorbidity. What is a comorbidity? I remember it as SOD. Most important is SOD. There are others also. S for smoking. Smokers have a higher risk of infection. Obesity, higher risk of infection. Diabetes, higher risk of infection. Okay. But COPDs also, patients will have higher risk of infections. And SSOs as well. Uh, what about grade three? Grade three and four are contaminated wounds, which means if there's a previous stoma, like a parastoma hernia, or while doing the operation, we had a gut injury. That's another. Three, there's an old mesh which is infected. There is a mesh sinus tract or a mesh abscess. These are grade three. And these in this area, 
uh, in these grade three wounds, we will probably not uh, do a mesh plasty. We will probably just do a anatomical repair and come out because the rate, uh, the infection rate is very high. In grade one and grade two, we can do it. In grade two, we have to control the comorbidity and then do the surgery. In grade three, uh, we can do an anatomical repair of the hernia if it's emergency or uh, optimize uh, and do it as a two-stage surgery. What are the intraoperative factors that, which can lead to a higher infection? A, laparoscopic surgery, as I said, has less chance of infection. Open surgery has a higher chance of infections. The, the environmental contamination, the skin contamination is higher. The, if there is a bowel injury and resection is done, that can lead to higher infection rate. If we place the mesh in the subcutaneous plane compared to a, a deeper plane, right, like a retromuscular plane, like an intraperitoneal plane, the chances of infection is higher. A subcutaneously placed mesh is higher, uh, so more susceptible to having uh, infection. And probably because this, it is so close to the skin and the skin commensals can infect. If we put in a drain for a longer period of time, that can cause more infection. And lastly, between polypropylene and polyester mesh, polyester mesh gives more infection rates. So these are preoperative factors and intraoperative factors for surgical site infections. How do we treat SSI in an IPOM? Well, usually if the coated mesh has got infected, they need to be explanted. They are potentially uh, not salvageable. The meshes which are salvageable are the ones which are there in the retromuscular plane. Uh, sometimes in the subcutaneous plane, these meshes can also be uh, salvaged, but coated mesh generally are um, very vulnerable and they have they get to be explanted more often than not. Now, SSO, surgical side occurrences. What are surgical side occurrences? Hematomas, seromas, infections, all of these together are SSO. So seroma is one part of SSO. Hematoma is a part of SSO. Surgical site infection is a part of SSO. Okay. Now, what is a seroma? So seroma is a collection at the hernia surgery site, which is confirmed either by clinical palpation or by imaging. That is a seroma. And that is how it would look like in a figure. In an eye palm, it would usually appear at a post-operative day seven, it would, uh, it, it generally we believe that in a laparoscopic eye palm, the seroma rates are higher than in an open surgery because in an open surgery, the sac is being excised. Third, in a reducible hernia, it's lower, but if it's an irreducible hernia because of the adhesions, probably and thing, uh, the energy source being used to bring down the uh, momentum and the bowel down from the sac, the seroma rates are higher. And lastly, as I mentioned in an eye palm, the seroma rates are higher. So these are some points that we need to know about seroma. Remember, that's a short note. It's a viva question. So you need to know these things about where it is more common, when does it appear, and what, how will we uh, reduce the seroma rates in an eye palm? Some people have tried cautery of the sac. It has the potential of burning the skin also if the skin and the sac are too thin, but this helps. Two, applying a compression dressing after the surgery is done over the uh, hernia site helps. So these two things can help, cautery and compression. What doesn't help? According to the guidelines, well, type of mesh doesn't help. If you try to staple the mesh to the sac, it doesn't help. If you try to take some stitches on the sac, it doesn't help. What is the treatment of the seroma? A, the majority of the seromas will resolve spontaneously. And sometimes we may need to do an aspiration if the seroma is huge, if it is painful, or if we are not confirmed whether it is a seroma or it's an abscess, okay? But if it is a seroma, by doing repeated aspiration, we may convert a seroma into an abscess and that could be a disaster. Then the mesh needs to come out. So this is one of those cases where the seromas happen and we had to aspirate them. And you can see this is a pure tissue fluid. This is not an abscess, okay? And in many times, these patients who are obese, one may not be able to confirm this with clinical palpation. One has to use an ultrasound to confirm an aspiration to be sure that you're not dealing with an abscess. Uh, delayed complication. The most important complication of a hernia is a recurrence. In fact, it is said, the harder you look, the more recurrence you get. So surgeons um, would probably be best not looking at their patients harder, but yes, recurrence is 
a huge thing about hernia. In fact, the most important outcome factor is the recurrence. The incidence can vary between 5 to 20% depending on what kind of hernias are we talking about, what hernia are we talking about, what patient factors are we talking about. And if somebody asks you in the exam or writes a short note, what are the factors which predict recurrence after hernia surgery, I think the best answer would be to say it depends on hernia factors, patient factors, technical factors. The hernia factors, the larger the width, the more chance of hernia, uh, of recurrence. If it's an incisional hernia versus a primary hernia, and incisional hernias have a higher chance of recurrence because more complex. Three, if the repair has been done earlier and it's a recurrent incisional hernia or a recurrent hernia, and we are again doing a repair, the chances of failing is higher. That's known from the data. What about the patient factors? We've already said that SOD, smokers, obesity, and diabetes, they predispose the patient to SSI. And SSI, uh, which means infections, will predispose more to recurrence. So smokers, obesity, and diabetes, this is going to predispose to more recurrence, directly and indirectly. Obesity, of course, will have more than one uh, ways of promoting recurrence. By inter increase intra-abdominal pressure itself, it will promote more recurrences. Then what are the surgeon factors? What are technical factors which can lead to more uh, recurrences? A, if the size of the mesh is smaller than what it should have been, the minimum overlap of five centimeter was not there for a small medium sized defect. For a large defect, the defect was not closed and a huge mesh was not given. Uh, three, if the location of the mesh is in the sublay position, in the retromuscular position, it, was, it has been shown that it is better than the only position, which is the subcutaneous position of the mesh. If the mesh gets displaced, not fixed properly, or the space created was more, and the mesh migrates, then that can lead to a recurrence. A mesh has the propensity to shrink, okay? A mesh has a propensity to shrink, and that is one of the major reasons for uh, uh, recurrence. And lastly, inadequate fixation. If the fixation is not adequate, then we may have uh, these uh, uh, recurrences. So this is one of those cases where the mesh has shrunken. You can see in the periphery of the mesh, there's a defect and the mesh has shrunken. It's like only eight centimeters now. What we put in was a 15 centimeter mesh. It's now looking only eight centimeters. So meshes shrink, right? This is a chronic seroma and that's another delayed complication. Moving from recurrence to chronic seroma, some seromas can be missed and they may have to be excised later on and this is how they will appear. As a chronic seroma, they have become encapsulated. So this is one another delayed uh, complication. The sepsis can be missed and patient can appear with a sinus tract after an eye pump. You can see two sinus tracts, one covered, one uncovered. And if you look at the MRI, you find that the sinus tract is communicating with the abscess where mesh is floating, right? So that is another complication. The delayed complications, recurrence, chronic seroma, um, uh, uh, chronic uh, infection, like with a sinus tract, and finally, adhesions. There's a paper by Dr. Nowitzki in 2007 where they showed that different meshes have different in, uh, adhesion rate. Look at the polypropylene, which is written as Marlex. Adhesion rate is 80%, and dual mesh, 0%. But meshes like procedure and composite that we use is about 20% and 40%. So there is some amount of adhesion which is there. How bad they are, we do not know. And with that, I think we've had enough. <laughs> literally and figuratively. I would like to stop here. I would also like to let you know that the next class would be a fortnight later and we will be dealing with large ventral hernias on that day. We'll be talking about component separation and minimal access techniques involved in those particular surgery. Dr. Patta, back to you. That was a wonderful lecture, I think, breathtakingly wonderful, I should say. There, there are a lot, a lot of points for students to learn, and I'm sure there'll be some questions from the audience. If any one of you want to comment or ask questions, please unmute. And uh, where we start with Dr. Anjali. Uh, yes, sir. Wonderful lecture, as usual, Dr. Beck, sir. Thank Only you so much. One thing uh, can't hear you. Uh, uh, one yeah. thing I have always, uh, because of the LSP uh, section, sir, the incision is going down and down. Literally, it is one centimeter above the pubic impasse. And we come across a lot of hernia. 
which are exactly located over the pubic symphysis sir what are the challenges in such situations where you cannot overlap the mesh all around 5 cm around the sac so how to deal with it sir yeah like so the point you have already described yeah so uh, because of the lack of time i did not put in all the videos but if you saw the subzipoid and then you saw the right iliac fossa hernia post appendectomy hernia where we did what we did was we reflected the peritoneum inferiorly and we exposed the entire you know inferior aspect containing the nerves and the iliac vessels for the shortage of time i did not show everything but all that was exposed similarly in a suprapubic hernia we would bring down the urinary bladder we will expose a suprapubic space just like we would do it at tapp for groin hernia we will go into the space of red zeus we will at least dissect 2 to 3 cm deep into the space of red zeus and uh, we would expose the iliac vessel the obturator uh, fossa on this side the entire myopectinal uh, orifice of prushod and then superiorly we can tag the mesh inferiorly we leave the mesh into this cave of fresius uh, we must remember the principle that the center of the mesh and the center of the defect should be the same so if you are saying now that it is just above the uh, pubic symphysis this particular uh, will not hold good this particular logic will not hold good probably only one third of your mesh will go inferiorly and two thirds will be at the top but that's fine because you we, we cannot go beyond this inferiorly and that is enough for any groin hernia it should be enough for a supra pubic hernia as well that overlap should be good enough for that okay, okay. and here you could use one could use a polypropylene mesh or a polyester mesh if it is entirely extra peritoneal but if the mesh is coming above and it is becoming partly extra peritoneal Uh, or partly intraperitoneal then one must use a composite mesh that is the key point oh, thank you so much thank you any other now uh, there someone there yeah please come up uh, by anand aditya anand uh, i am dr ashok i am not aditya anand sir so it's it's why the name of my that's son. what is written there yeah 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 this name of my son sir my question is uh, Uh, yeah. What the idea of uh, having five centimeter overlap? Because why I am asking is it the shrinkage only or why I am asking is this because when we put uh, we, when we do uh, open hernia we don't uh, care for five centimeter overlap there. What the mm -hmm. answer? Okay, so uh, th this is about eye palm. The history of IPOM begins like this: that in the 1990s, when IPOM was without defect closure, a defect size of let's say five centimeters, ten centimeters, and the mesh has to be put inside. It was seen that if one placed in any mesh which was less than five centimeter from the defect margin, then the recurrence rate was higher. That was the data which was getting available. of course by the end of uh, the last century we came to know that larger defects presented with uh, recurrence even with 5 cm overlap so as i mentioned in one passing statement that don't be religious about the 5 cm overlap for a small and medium size defect a 5 cm overlap is the minimum overlap minimum from the defect margin if we close a defect then the margin uh, you know uh, is zero the defect is zero the overlap would be probably 7 and 1/2 cm for a 15 cm mesh also if we were to uh, deal with a 10 cm wide defect a 5 cm overlap will not be enough there's a concept which says that the defect area and mesh area ratio is more important than the overlap of the uh defect with the mesh so don't be religious about the 5 cm overlap but that is the minimum that is maintained by the guidelines so if you're doing anything low, lower than that it's it's not right not acceptable above it is acceptable you can go for 8 10 15 no numbers given there right does it answer your question sir yeah 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 thank you thank you sir thank you sir uh sir my question is hello my sir dr sandeep yeah please uh, my question is sir uh, in 
in uh, lateral hernia uh, epig- uh, appendicectomy and post polycystectomy when we will repair then it is inevitably we will have to do the tar hmm. yes so uh, that question is good i wanted to keep it for the next class but uh, yes since we have raised it whenever we are dealing with these lateral hernias the lateral hernias uh, if we go up in the posterior rectus sheath and then we want to get back to the preperitoneal pain we will have to do a tar i will explain that to others because you already understand this it is good and easy for us that you, uh, one has to understand that if we have to go from the retro rectus space the rib stopper space to the preperitoneal space laterally we have to do a tar however there are people who can also do a preperitoneal repair that's a tapp approach for a right iliac posterior hernia for a post polycystectomy drain site hernia we can do a tapp approach also although the peritoneal number of peritoneal holes that we make technically is much higher but uh, yes it is possible uh, but ideally yes we need to go from posterior rectus sheath uh, into the retro rectus space do a tar and get into that space this space we can enter directly with a etap technique but again i don't want to do too much today let's keep it very very simple and basic today next class we will take those uh, topics as well yeah nilesh taneja thank you yeah, thank good you evening, good evening sir very good very evening. Uh, explained lecture sir i wanted thank to thank you ask, so much please throw some light on uh, pulling the sac after radicalisis and tacking the sac with the parietal wall to reduce uh, chances of seroma formation yeah so this concept is good for a direct groin hernia if one has a direct groin hernia if i am dealing with a direct groin hernia then the sac uh, the pseudo sac can be brought down and tacked to the anterior abdominal wall or the pubic bone okay and this does reduce the seroma rates however with an indirect inguinal hernia with a ventral hernia more often than not one cannot pinch the sac separate from the skin and tack it inside if it is possible one can do it and as i have mentioned in two slides those would be what you're saying could be an experimental thing one off thing that can be done but what is mentioned in the guidelines based on the data is what works is a compression bandage and a cautery what doesn't work a quilting stitch doesn't work uh, the kind of mesh doesn't work fixing the mesh to the sac doesn't work and what you're saying is pulling the sac back and into the abdominal cavity and tacking it hasn't shown to be reproducible neither so efficacious thank you sir thank you yeah any other questions there is a question in the chat box uh, it's a first from dr bharat sangal he says what is the latest consensus on drain placement in ipom okay so as far as ipom is concerned uh, pure ipom there is no uh, requirement of putting in any drain uh, i i don't think anybody puts in a drain for an ipom if there was any fear of bleed one would handle the bleed rather than put in a drain but if one were to do a hybrid ipom which means let's say one did an adhesolysis and found that the defect closure is difficult one can make a small incision excise the sac close the sheath from above and then put in a mesh laparoscopically and fix it in that case if the skin incision and the fat of that person is so huge that it, one requires to put in a subcutaneous drain for the seroma reducing the seroma one can do that so in a hybrid ipom a subcutaneous drain can be given but not intraperitoneal drain now let's come to open only mesh repair for an open only mesh repair almost always most surgeons majority of the surgeon would put in the drain because the achilles heel of only mesh repair is a seroma uh, some people have started using like gee voila they have started showing that if we do glue then the seroma rates can go down but so far i think all of almost all of us would put in a drain for only mesh on your plastic okay the second part of his question is uh, at what anatomical layer does the serum form in i form yeah i put in a figure a figure there 
to explain that that this is between the sac and the mesh right in an i pom pure i pom where we have not done any i pom plus there is a sac and the mesh remember there is a portion where the mesh and the sac have a uh, they don't have a they, they have a uh, unobliterated cavity so to say so that space is going to get occupied with the fluid secreted by the sac and it will stay between the mesh and the sac so that is where it is so we should excise the sac and close the effect that is i pom plus to prevent so that is hybrid i pom what i uh, what what you said sir right now is an hybrid i pom if i had to excise the sac make a small incision excise the sac close the defect from the top is an hybrid i pom plus i pom plus is when we are doing it purely laparoscopically we have gone in inside the peritoneal cavity done adhesolysis Uh, closed the defect, and after closing the defect intracorporally, we put in the mesh. So the sac is still there, the sac is still there, but okay. we have closed the partial defect together. Okay, before, is that clear to you? Yeah, but before closing sac, we can excise the sac intra intraperitoneally from intraperitoneal. So the sac is usually adherent to the skin. Ask uh, okay, 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 somebody okay. who asked why can't we do the sac. Uh, uh, tack it to the anterior abdominal wall. Same reason. The sac and the skin are adherent to each other. Sac and the fat is adherent to each other. If you try to bring it down, it will tear apart. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, is it necessary to suture, or is it a part of eye palm to suture the defect from inside? Uh, is it uh, important to suture? You say. Yeah. Is it a part of eye palm to suture the defect from the inside? No, uh, let's get this again straight. I pom means I go inside, bring the we will bring the adhesions down. We will not close the defect. Apply a mesh. That's classical I pom. If we were closing the defect, if I have shown you all the videos of closing the defect, primarily because I want to put this straight that most surgeons are now moving towards I pom plus. Whenever we close the partial defect, it's called CFD, closure of partial defect. as soon as you do closure of partial defect it becomes from i pom to i pom plus okay, okay? okay. excision of sac is not a part and parcel of this that would be hybrid i pom plus so even if there is any confusion please send it to me i will show you send you pictures to make you understand this okay okay you. i pom plus means closure of partial defect okay uh, uh, sir up to 5 cm size defect can be closed bigger uh, defect is difficult to close So up to five centimeter defects, yes, can be closed. Even larger defects can be closed, depending on the compliance of the abdominal wall. Women have a better compliance, can be closed. Younger men, very poorly compliant, can't be closed well. It's a technical answer. Okay. Thank you. So, any more questions? Thank you so much. Good question. Uh, sir, one more concept: uh, where to use the light and heavy weight mesh? And where to use the macro and the micro porous mix in general, sir? Very good question. Very very good question. Uh, let me be very clear with this first that the concept of meshes being light and heavy is getting very fuzzy. Uh, so although we know that less than forty grams per uh, centimeter uh, per meter square is a lightweight mesh, forty to ninety is medium weight, above ninety is heavy weight. we do say all that and then macro porous is more than you know a pore more than 1 mm and less than 1 mm thus micro and macro porous uh lightweight mesh and uh, heavy weight mesh uh is a recent concept a heavy weight mesh is used if we are doing an open surgery and we are not able to close the defect and there's a bridge we have not been able to close the defect there's a bridge so we are going to now rely in this area the mesh only and no tissue no human tissue so this is the indication for a heavy weight polypropylene mesh many surgeons would use that two in a groin hernia or a lumbar hernia where there is a recurrence or a big defect size some surgeons with their own uh, without any evidence would use a heavy weight polypropylene mesh thinking that a light weight may lead to recurrence as you know an ultra light weight mesh has been shown to have more recurrence in a groin hernia repair but ultra light is something different that's less than uh, 30 grams uh, so we are not talking about ultra light but yes it has been shown so we all have apprehensions as surgeons 
that a lightweight mesh can lead to higher recurrence. So when we deal with rec uh, recurrent hernias, large defect hernia, the large direct groin hernia, um, uh, uh, open surgery, an open component separation where there's a bridge, then we're using heavy polypropylene mesh. Between microporous and macroporous, the idea is simple. Most of us are shifting to using macroporous mesh, realizing that the microscopic anatomy of the macroporous mesh in cooperation, it appears to be better. Okay, so macroporous mesh is being used. The second advantage of macroporous mesh is that it is salvageable to infection. Because the pore size is big, the macrophages, which is 0.8 nanometers, can still go in and scavenge the bacteria, which is not possible in a microporous mesh. This is what is being thought. I, am, I will not say this is gospel truth. This is what is believed these days. A macroporous mesh is salvageable. So most surgeons who are doing open surgery use macroporous mesh. Okay. So on that note, uh, Safraz, I think uh, we have drained you enough for, for an hour and a half <laughs> non-stop and it's a wonderful <laughs> session. We'll be waiting for your next session. Thank you so much for your effort and time. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. For being Thank here. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pata. Thank you, everybody who was here. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Dr. Pata, sir, uh, there have been no class on diaphragmatic hernia, I think, particularly on the diaphragmatic hernia. Dr. Baik, sir, I request <laughs> also you to. Yeah, and yeah, there's a request, will... uh, Sarfaz, you, you have to take it up sometime. Yeah, I, I note that. I'll note that. I will bring it up. Yeah, we'll sure. definitely take it in the future Thank classes. Thank, Thank you very you. much.